What do Canadians think about God and religion? The answer might surprise you. That's next. Religion in Canada is changing. One snapshot, more Canadian teens identify as Muslims than Anglican, Baptist, or United Church combined. Today on Context, Lorna digs deep into a new national study on what Canadians believe. We'll survey this new emerging landscape and talk with experts Angus Reid and Reginald Bibby, and with everyday Canadians, and discuss the big questions of life that never seem to go away. Is religion dying out in Canada? Are Canadians allergic to God and God talk? A new national poll shows that Canadian attitudes about religion and spirituality are more complex than that. So, for the big picture, here's Sheldon Neal with some fast facts. Thank you so much, Lorna. Well, the Angus Reid Institute polled over 3,000 Canadians to discover what they believe about religion and God. They asked, where would you locate yourself on the religious or spiritual spectrum? 30% report they are inclined to embrace religion. But just under that, 26% say they lean towards bypassing or rejecting religion. And yes, the rest, the largest number report, they are ambivalent. 44% say they were, are somewhere in between. They rank somewhere there. They are not pro-atheists, but neither are they strong believers. So what kind of relationship do Canadians have with God? Well, it's complicated. So is Canada becoming less religious or more or both? Our first guests are the two best people to answer that. Joining us are Canada's leading pollsters on the future of religion. They've asked the questions and crunched the numbers. Angus Reid, founder of the Angus Reid Institute and from the University of Lethbridge, Dr. Reginald Bibby, welcome you both to Context. Great to be here. Awesome. Well, let's dive into your findings. You surveyed over 3,000 Canadians. It's a large survey. You wanted their views on religion. What did you find, Angus? Is Canada becoming more or less religious? Well, it's a little more complex than that. I think the bottom line is that this has become a much more diverse society in terms of religion. Now, there's about 30% of Canadians who really, religion is a hugely important part of their life. They pray, they go to, uh, they go to religious services. There's another 27% of Canadians, and this is somewhat new, who are almost anti-religious. You know, over the three or four decades I've been polling, we've seen, we've seen atheists who are sort of off on the sideline, but we have the emergence of, of now a, a segment in Canadian society that just doesn't much like religion, thinks that religion's a, a negative force. Right, and then there's a whole bunch in the middle that really represent, uh, you know, the future of religion in the sense of people who are who are looking, but but not yet there. Okay, Rich, let's have you join us here now from Lethbridge. What do you conclude about the findings? Well, I, th I think the thing that stands out uh, particularly for me is the fact that religion in Canada knows an incredible uh, high level of vitality. Uh, when we look at the current situation, it's clear that people who were claiming just in the, frankly over the last few decades that things were pretty much uh, dead and over for religion, that uh, secularization was simply going to reign in Canada. They were wrong, and uh, what our survey documents is the fact, as Angus has just alluded to, the, is the fact that there's a solid core of people who value faith, uh, an awful lot in the middle who haven't given up on religion, a relatively small uh, sector that actually is uh, negative with respect to religion. If we throw in also the immigration variable, then the fact of the matter is that uh, the future of religion uh, it looks very bright in Canada. I've been quipping to people that it definitely is a growth industry, Lorna, no question about it. Okay, I'm not going to be quite as positive about your poll, gentlemen, <laughs> because this 27% that are actually anti-religion, that find it worrisome, they rate evangelicals like me very poorly. What, what do we know about those who are inclined to reject religion, well, Angus? These, you know, Canada has become, over the course of the last couple of decades, a very, uh, you know, postmodern society. We almost uh, view as a calling card of being Canadian the fact that we're really deeply into physician-assisted suicide. This is a free abortion thing. We've done some work lately on the abortion file. There's a big segment of Canadians who think this is wonderful that we actually have no law. We're the most advanced society. So there's, there's a segment that actually almost 
thinks that a post-modern, post-religious Canadian society is where to be. And they have been encouraged by people like Dawkins and the late uh, Christopher Hitchens and others, a, a large movement of, you know, uh, you know, uh, God is the enemy. And, and, and people have moved into that uh, segment, and it's new. I've seen a lot of uh, sort of uh, almost disparaging people with religious, but that person's an, ev an evangelical, so therefore let's just ignore them. I think the fact that we've got as large a segment in Canadian society who are not afraid of their beliefs and not afraid of God, that, uh, that, that it's time for them to stand up and be counted as well. Okay, a polarized place, and like you said, it's new to have that 27% be anti-God. But Reg, the biggest group of Canadians are those you call the ambivalent ones. Tell us how they are viewing religion. I think what's uh, important to keep in mind is that the, uh, the vast majority of the people in that ambivalent middle have certainly not given up on religion. We're finding, for example, that about 70% of them show up for services at least occasionally. Uh, we've got about 70% of them who claim that they believe in God and beyond believing in God, well, well they are maintaining that uh, they believe in a God who cares about them. Uh, we're finding that a surprising number of, uh, of, of those people, something like four in 10, say that they're open to the possibility of being more involved if they can find it worthwhile. And even in terms of a very practical thing, are they expecting to have a religious funeral? About one in three of them are. So I would argue that the ambivalent middle certainly can go either way. But at this point in time, many people who do value faith probably know those people well. They're often relatives, they're friends, uh, they're, they're people who are not that far from religion, but at this point have to be convinced that uh, greater involvement is really worth their while. Okay, you asked people to respond to this statement. What's right or wrong is a matter of personal opinion. And here's the breakdown of that on our screen. Split right down the middle, 51% agree that what's right or wrong is a matter of personal opinion. So, Reg, what does this say about how Canadians are going to decide what is right and what is wrong? Well, there's absolutely no question that for a good while, this it certainly is not uh, a new finding for a long period of time. I would go say back uh, to the 1980s in the case of young people, uh, probably around the same time for adults, uh, people have been inclined to um, treat truth as something that is highly subjective. And so we've found, uh, to the horror of religious leaders, that very often people who are involved as Catholics and Protestants nonetheless uh, agree with that statement. But having said that, Lauren, it's interesting to me that we've got... I don't know, somewhere around 40% of Canadians who we might say are at least fairly uh, involved in religious groups, fairly uh, frequent as far as attendance, yet we've got 50%, we've got another 10% of the population that does buy into the idea that uh, what's right or wrong uh, is not a matter of personal opinion. I, I think that reflects what Angus was alluding to earlier and uh, that is so uh, dominant as far as the survey findings. And that's that we just have a polarized uh, reality in Canada some people embracing faith, some people not, a lot in the middle. And so when we ask them about their sources, when it comes to uh, uh, understanding truth, uh, we're, they're simply extremely varied. Okay. Reg Bibby, we are losing our window in, in Lethbridge, and we're going to let you go at that. You've got much more of this both on our website mm -hmm. and at uh, the Angus Reid Institute. Thank you very much for being with us, Reg. Good to be there. Good All right. Show. Angus, let's continue here in the audience. Um, you discovered that a major factor in shaping Canadian is a Canadian's religious perspective is immigration. What did you learn about that? Well, we, we have uh, Canada brings in 250, 300,000 immigrants a year. They're coming from the Philippines, in many cases Latin America. They're coming from Catholic countries or Christian countries. Uh, South Korea, a, a very good example, and they are settling in some of the major cities, Vancouver, Toronto, even Montreal. And the result is a resurgence. I can tell you in Vancouver, uh, the, the Archbishop uh, was telling me that they're, they're actually out building new churches. They can't build them fast enough. So, so this, is, this has added a new element to uh, the whole story of religion and where it fits into Canadian societies. Because these are people who are having bigger families, uh, individuals where the family tends to be more important, more of a center of people's lives. And, and it does change the complexion of religion in Canada. 
Okay, well, our audience now wants in on this discussion. So, Sheldon, you're there with some interesting ideas. That's right, Lorna. I'm actually here with Professor David Rayside, who tracked these Canadian statistics on religion for his classes in political science at the University of Toronto. Uh, my question to you, sir, is why do you think Canadians drift away from the organized church life? So there's a much, much bigger phenomenon and, and large social trends at work. Part of it is the growth of big cities, the growth of individualism, increases in levels of education. Uh, all of those things make uh, attachment to traditional beliefs of all co uh, kinds, including religion, more difficult to retain. That's one factor. Another factor is that, that uh, traditional church teachings or religious teachings, because this isn't just a phenomenon of Christianity, often don't speak to changed realities in everyday life. And I would say a third thing is that a lot of uh, the teachings of uh, various faith currents in Canada and beyond uh, are very punitive. And lots of people feel, you know, left out by that. Gays and lesbians are an obvious example of people who have felt that they have not been fairly treated by many uh, faith traditions. And so faced with a choice between living their lives as they feel they want to live them and adhering to uh, the established religious doctrine that they've grown up with, they'll abandon the latter in favor of the former. Professor David Reisai, thank you so much for those insights. And I want to turn to our audience here, digging deeper. Part of what we do here at Context is turning to you for uh, further insights. Our question, where do you think religion went wrong that only 30% of Canadians are enthusiastic about engaging with it? Why, did it? why does it seem that Canadians are checking out? Some, some responses from you. Yes, my friend over here. I think if you look at the behaviors of believers in various aspects of faith, like the rigidness, uh, the hypocrisy, and the, and, and the radicalism, I think that would that's what would turn people off of religion and into no religion at all or ambivalence. Any other insights? Yes, my friend here, let me get this mic to your hands. Why does it seem that Canadians are checking out? I mean, we're looking at, in the, in the 20th century and 21st century, the extreme rise of materialism, which has once turned religion into mere formalism and separated form from spirit. And so religion seems to be the form. And so we have now a desire to be spiritual without being religion, religious. Um, when in reality, if you look at, at religious traditions, in, in essence, they're both, um, they have a form and a, and a spirit. Interesting, so a lack of connection maybe that needs to be found again. Yes, my friend here. I think that it's, um, in my opinion, predominantly due from, from I believe is, is due to uh, just a lack of experience of God, a personal transformational experience of God as opposed to a outwardly practiced religion. Okay. Lorna, back to you. All right, thank you. Angus, a lot of interesting opinions. I want to know why this religion poll mattered to you. <clears throat> the, uh, the truth is that, that, uh, that as a young man, uh, I had a religious awakening. I, I went to a Jesuit high school and university. I grew up in a family of uh, eight kids. My oldest brother was Down syndrome. Everyone was going around saying, well, you know, your mother should have aborted him. He's 60, he's actually 72 years old now, and he's a great guy. And I just think that, you know, we need to have uh, better leadership in this country. We have a very large group of leaderless Christians in Canada who really can't see anyone in the political spectrum that, that can, you know, begin to adopt their views or which, where they can have some impact on some of the policies that affect them. Policies like, uh, you know, are we gonna have prayer at city council meetings or are we going to, uh, how, how far are we gonna go in physician assisted suicide? So these are, these are important policy issues that have got a religious connotation but we lack leadership. But it's more than policy for you. You're saying this thing really matters in my life. My personal connection to God matters so much. I want Canadians to understand you shouldn't just let it wash out in culture. Well, I think there has to be a moral basis to leadership. And I think that, that the 30% of Canadians who have got strong feelings have got to stop being marginalized. They actually have to start to fight for some of the things they believe, not fighting in a, in a physical sense, but they need to stand up and be counted. All right. And I'm one of them. Angus Reid, charting the changing religious face in Canada. Thank you very much. My pleasure. 
Well, as you've seen, the data shows many Canadians are unsure about God. But what happens when God shows up in your life in an unexpected way? That's next. Here at Context, we love to hear from you, our viewers at home. Recently, David wrote, your show is ridiculous. Hopefully no tax dollars are funding this garbage. Well, David, you'll be happy to know that our show is entirely funded by our viewers. And we'd like to take this opportunity to say how much we appreciate your donations to help us share Christian stories. Thank you for helping us make television we can all be proud of. Well, everyone except for David. This segment is brought to you by Bruce Etherington and Associates. Family harmony and philanthropy, helping you help others. Today we're unpacking a new national survey that shows how detached more than half the Canadian population is from any organized practice of religion. Let's look more closely at the personal face of those stats now. Joining us from London, Ontario is Carolyn Weber. She is the author of Surprised by Oxford, a spiritual memoir. Carolyn, welcome to Context. You tell a story about your life in Surprised by Oxford that has lots of twists and turns. And we've been discussing the different attitudes Canadians have about religion. And in this book, you describe yourself as growing up a skeptical agnostic. What's the backstory there? Tell us what was your attitude about religion and God as you grew up there in London, Ontario? Well, I, I think it was in many ways um, a non-attitude. I, I didn't really believe in God. And as I got older, I'd always felt um, a presence, uh, a longing in my life, but I wouldn't have defined it as God in some ways. As I got older and was able to think through it, I would have defined myself then as an agnostic, not an atheist, because I couldn't disprove God. Uh, and so religion was something that I was hesitant about, especially organized religion. And God was not a concept that I identified with personally. You went a scholarship to Oxford that was life-changing. And how did your world begin to expand when you studied there? Well, it expanded immensely, Lorna, because I uh, had grown up essentially in a home that I would have defined as, uh, you know, as loving enough to get by, but broken enough not to deserve God's attention. Um, my, uh, my father was quite successful as a businessman. We, we enjoyed uh, a very wealthy lifestyle when I was young, and then he went through a situation where he lost most of his business and um, had a charge of fraud brought against him, and he had ended up having um, essentially a nervous breakdown as a result and uh, and left the family and my mother was left to raise us as a single mother and things were tight I was working from a young age to support my family and to help out with my siblings and when I won the scholarship to Oxford it actually came with if I'm honest the most money I'd ever seen in my life I was able to go to England and study but also send money home and I was able to enter into an environment at Oxford of contemplation of time to study, to read, to think. And I think there's this opiate of busyness that keeps us from thinking about other larger things in our lives, the most important things and the spiritual things. It was a slow process, but what began to make you doubt your agnosticism and those attitudes you had about God? Well, I think uh, as Socrates says, the unexamined life is not worth living. And we all have to look at our lives. and. God is the big question. I think God is the biggest question that there is. I was reading about world religions for my MPhil thesis at the time. So I was going to lots of lectures and talks about various religions and I was studying that and Christianity was among those, but I also was drawn to it by the Christians I was beginning to meet and how they were actually living their faith out before me. And I had the time simply to read the Bible uh, as a book at first, cover to cover. Um, but I think it's tremendously important that we doubt wisely and that we also believe wisely. You've stated that reason and faith did not seem like opposites at Oxford. What do you mean by that? I began to realize that uh, that, that was actually quite a narrow way of looking at <clears throat> faith, uh, that it was okay to ask questions. Uh, because on one hand, you can see people of faith who are afraid to ask questions, that somehow their faith won't be able to withstand it. 
or that God is a fragile God. And we know that God is not a fragile God. He can withstand the arrows of our questions. But also how curiosity, doubt, questions lead us to God and are part of our wiring to glorify him and to find him uh, and also to grow deeper in an understanding of him. So uh, I began to realize that they were actually very much intermingled, that um, really at the heart of, of life, I believe, is paradox. And we tend to think of paradox as a contradiction, but it's not, it's an apparent contradiction. It's something that, it's something that seems to be a contradiction, but actually works together to have a deeper meaning. And what attracted you to Jesus? Well, Jesus ticked me off at first. <laughs> um, one of the first people I ever met who was a Christian who clearly articulated his faith was this friend of mine who lived down the hall in the dorm room situation I was in in England. And he was really one of the first people ever in my life to uh, ask me who God was to me. No one had ever actually asked me that question. And at the time, I actually felt like a, hum a hummingbird that had hit the glass hard. I'd been so busy working and getting grades and studying and being self-sufficient, especially coming from a broken home. And you know, if fathers weren't to be trusted, eternal fathers certainly weren't to be. And when he asked me that question, it forced me to stop and actually think, who was God to me? And so after I was a, done being angry with him and actually prepared to look at who he was, because the gospel is such a, an amazing thing. Once you hear it, you can't unhear it. It's like this elephant in the room, whether you reject it or get upset or react against it, or it just sits in your heart and, you, and you, you're not sure what to do with it, it's there. And uh, it demands our answer. At some point, the Bible began to make new sense to you. It moved you. And the Bible tells a story of God's love for this world, a story about sin and salvation. How did that story become a true one for you? Yes, because it was at first an alien thing. I mean, I think my initial reaction to actually seriously thinking about Jesus and who he says he is, is, uh, is the really the old argument, is he a liar, a lunatic, or is he Lord, you know? And um, if he is a liar, a lunatic, then those things don't hold. But if he is who he says he was and is and will always be, then that changes everything. And, uh, and I think it, it, it was an important touchstone in my life at looking at what he was offering in terms of grace. Uh, it allows, I know for me, it allowed me to start to think about my life in different ways. Peter Kreeft says so wonderfully that life is fatal for all of us. And one of the driving questions is, what happens to us when we die? And that infiltrates everything we do. And I know for me, I, I saw these Christians living this more abundant life. I saw that for them, and not in trite ways, but things like even suffering had meaning. Um, that there was a, not just random acts of kindness, but acts of kindness were done for a real reason. Um, and I wanted that, and I also realized that the freedom and the peace that living your life according to grace offers does surpass everything else that, anything else that the world can offer. It was a long time for me intellectually to wrangle with many of the issues. I fought for several months against my, against my Christian friends and um, slowly started going to Bible studies, slowly started getting drawn in. I wasn't as bad as C.S. Lewis who says, you know, he was the most reluctant convert in all of England. <laughs> but I think I got to a point where all of the kicking and fighting and whatnot against it, I still realized that I wanted to believe in spite of not being able to believe, which is also a prayer that is, is in the Bible. Please, Lord, help me in my disbelief. Help me believe in my disbelief, which is the lowliest of all prayers. And that was eventually what I prayed. And my heart did crack open. Um, there is incredible power in the gospel. Dr. Carolyn Weber, author of Surprise by Oxford, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure to be with you. Sheldon Neal, over to you for a question to our audience at home. Thank you so much, Lorna. And yes, we're asking Context is doing a little poll of our own. We want to know, how would you describe your spiritual leaning? Are you skeptical about Christianity? Or maybe you are a follower of Jesus or another faith tradition? 
We've got a web poll for you at our website, contextwithlorna.com. Find it on our Context homepage as well. To contact us, you can call us on the number you see, 1-800-215-4913. Or write to us by email at comments at contextwithlorna.com. And you can always find us on Facebook and Twitter at Context TV. When we come back, let me tell you something personal about the spiritual journey that hits home for me. I'm Rose Meter. I'm a mom, a wife, and an ER doctor in rural Canada. This year, my husband Rob and I have decided to take our four kids on a trip around the world. We have no idea what lies ahead. I'll be updating our journey on the Context with Lorna Duick website with blog posts and videos about our triumphs and trials and adventures. Won't you join us? And now it's your chance to win a book selection this week through Lorna's Books. You simply go to the website, you click in on Lorna's Books, and you enter to win our choice this week, which is Surprised by Oxford by Dr. Carolyn Weber, an amazing faith journey that we think will really help you go deeper on the topic we discovered today about our faith journey and the choices we need to make about it. So enter to win a free copy by going to our website, contextwithlorna.com. Coming soon on Context, T.D. Jakes, the remarkable motivational pastor, sits down with Sheldon Neal in Dallas, Texas to talk about dreams and the motivation it takes to make them come true. You won't want to miss it. I'm old enough to, perhaps like you, have been in and out on belief in God. But now I'm in all the way. Why? Because I have found belief in God as compelling source material. And the source story for me is in the Bible. One of my favorite interviews has been with Bible scholar Eugene Peterson, who in the late 90s wrote the Bible into a common English vernacular. It was called The Message. And in that rendering, here's how the words of Jesus sound. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Keeping company with Jesus is different than keeping company with religion. If this raises questions or a challenge for you, write us on our email. We read and answer all of it. And we'd like to say thank you for getting in touch with us. So, for all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for watching. Join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. <laughs>